We're talking about war a lot in this week's show, but I want to talk about war, uh, not just contemporary war, but uh, the American history of war, particularly uh, during the Civil War. And our next guest wrote a fascinating article uh, called War Happens in Dark Places Too, and it really addresses, uh, you know, we tend to think too much in this society in, in homogenous blocks of people. And what her, one of the things her article did that I found was fascinating was it addressed uh, poor white people in the South uh, during the Confederacy who did not support uh, the war against the states and the war between the states and uh, why they didn't support it and what they did about it. And I think it's fascinating not only inherently but for the kind of light it might cast on divisions within our own society. We don't think about all that much, so I wanted to bring her on and talk to her about it, and she kindly agreed. Carrie Lee Merritt is a historian and writer based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, her, she has written a book entitled Masterless Men, Poor Whites and Slavery in the Antebellum South. She is also co-editor with Matthew Hild of a book entitled Reconsidering Southern Labor History, Race, Class, and Power. And she joins us now. So first of all, Carrie, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me. And is it okay to call you Carrie or Professor Merritt? I actually go by the, the Southern Carrie Lee. That's That was going to be my third possibility. I thought as soon as I said it might be Carrie Lee. Okay, Carrie Lee, thanks so much for coming on the program and for correcting me there. Um, so, first of all, war happens in dark places, too. Uh, I think I know the answer to this, but what, but what led you to write it? So... I've always been very, very interested in Southern history. I, I was born in Southern Mississippi. I've, I've spent almost my whole life in the South. And I knew that there was a much more complicated narrative about not only the Civil War, but, but the kind of lost cause narrative that, we're, that we even hear today about all Southern whites being united over slavery, united over secession and the Confederacy. And this comes out of my larger work, which was um, a book that was from my PhD dissertation where I looked at poor whites in the Deep South, in the Cotton South. And these are people who didn't own land and didn't own slaves. And actually, I argue that their lives were socioeconomically um, detrimentally impacted by slavery itself because these are people who were primarily agricultural day laborers and, and tenants and, and sharecroppers. And their labor gets displaced as slavery takes over the Deep South, the Cotton South, and they find themselves in long stretches of unemployment, underemployment, and they very acutely understand that slavery is to blame for much of their uh, socioeconomic distresses. And these people were not largely uh, supportive of secession or the Confederacy. In the Upper South, you have many more unionists and people who align themselves align themselves with the Union Party. But in the Deep South, where not a lot of information was coming in and poor whites were largely illiterate, they really didn't know what was going on on a national level. And so instead, they just wanted to be left alone. They didn't want to go fight for the slave property of rich slaveholders. They had no desire to do that. They just wanted to be left alone, stay at home with their wives and family. And, and so a lot of these men during the Civil War I classified them basically as anti-Confederates and they chose to stay at home and not fight or even when they were drafted, they, they came back home, they escaped back home as soon as they could. And so this piece was showing what happens to these men who are hiding out, who are deserting from the Confederate army in a very particular place, the Pearl River Swamp in this case, where they're hiding out from um, Confederates who are trying to conscript them and bring them back into the army. So in essence, what you were describing here a little bit, there were a number of things that fascinated me about it, but one of the things you were describing here, Carrie Lee, was almost, it had elements of class war to it. And it, first of all, I didn't know about the so-called 20 Negroes Act, which said that slaveholders with more than 19, that is to say 20 and above, uh, slaves were exempted from the draft. So there was a clear, in my view, 
a, a class element in the way this was uh, structured, the draft was structured for the Confederacy, but also, of course, uh, the people who were most directly benefiting from uh, the, Confeder the creation of the Confederacy were the people m exempted from uh, from having to put their lives on the line to defend it. So that, to me, seems like uh, a strong incitement to resistance for poor whites who are, if anything, losing out as a result of this economic system. Absolutely, and, and they fully knew this. And this is not to say that they were not racist. They were certainly racist, but that didn't mean that they wanted to go and fight and die for slavery and for the, the slave interest of these rich, rich people who controlled everything in the society. And, you know, at the very beginning of the Civil War, there were some economic incentives for these men to go fight. You know, it was a steady, decent wage um, in an area where they're, you know, largely unemployed. It was, um, there's actually a promise of land in many ways because every other veteran in American wars up until the Civil War got land from the government, essentially got free land. So it would have provided, you know, supposedly an opportunity for them to become landed yeoman farmers. And, but still there were not that many of them joining out of, of sheer will. Now there were vigilance committees and slave patrols and different Confederate officers who would, you know, arrest them or force them to go. But what happens in 1862 is that the Confederate um, government passes a conscription act. And this is actually right, you know, right before they pass the so-called 20 Negro Act. So these two acts, and this is when you see droves and droves of poor white men being enlisted in the Confederate Army after conscription. Well, that happens in 62 and 63. Desertions are off the chart. And this is exactly, you know, 64 by 1960, or 1864, almost two thirds of the Confederate Army was gone, missing, had gone back home to their families. They were done fighting. Now, uh, what led, was that just battlefield losses or was it a sense of alienation from the mission or what led to that massive level of desertion? There are many, many things. Uh, the length of the war itself, you know, being gone for so long from their families. A lot of these men are getting letters sent home or sent to them on the war front from home telling them of literal starvation of their families mm -hmm. and they want nothing more than to go back and take care of their families. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense. You know, uh, yeah, you're a historian, and again, we're talking with, with Carrie Lee Merritt, uh, author of, among other things, War Happens in Dark Places too, an, an article about uh, these poor white uh, resistors, you might say, to the uh, Confederate system. Uh, I thought, uh, it, it, when I was reading your article about uh, Theodore W. Allen's book, The Invention of the White Race, and the notion that maybe some of these poor whites who are feeling, uh, as you say, almost all probably held racist sentiments, but uh, did not want to fight for the institution of slavery, that I was wondering if maybe they weren't some of the same populations Alan was writing about in his book, who, you know, in Alan's thesis, I don't want to oversimplify it, but that the notion of whiteness being introduced in order to encourage uh, uh, white Americans in particular and white British and white Scottish immigrants so on to tolerate uh, harsh economic conditions, particularly as tenant farmers and so on, uh, with racism, the idea that they're superior to black people and so on. I wonder to what extent uh, Allen's thesis overlaps with the kind of history you're writing about here. It absolutely does, but I argue much like W.E.B. Du Bois argues, is that there's an actual uh, real shift in racial class alignment that happens right after the first few years of emancipation and reconstruction. So that under slavery, poor whites still always had a foot up right, on, on, on black people in America. And so actually racial relations between the two groups were much more fluid under slavery. They, they traded together, they had a, a complete underground economy together, they socialized together, slept together, had real relationships. But what happens after emancipation is that, you know, white solidarity eventually occurs, and this occurs for several reasons. Um, upper class whites are, are courting poor whites and bringing them into all the privileges of whiteness because they need them as racial allies at the polls. 
once black men are, are granted the right to vote, they need white racial solidarity. And so they really court them and really bring them into all the privileges of whiteness. But they're also getting handouts from the government and, and things like the Homestead Acts, which gives away massive acre, you know, millions and millions of acres of land, basically the size of California and Texas today, to white people and white immigrants. At the exact same time, we're telling formerly enslaved people that they're not going to get 40 acres and a mule. And so we see white privilege very acutely right at this time. Yeah, that's fascinating. So let me ask you this then, um, Carrie Lee. Uh, so then uh, uh, black people were systematically disenfranchised following Reconstruction and not, in, not until uh, the 1960s and the civil rights movement were they re-enfranchised. Does that mean that, that, that then that these upper class whites no longer politically needed the lower class whites and uh, abandoned the alliance with them or did it just continue out of habit or what happened then? Well, it, it kind of ebbs and flows throughout history and certainly even the, the late 19th century is really interesting because I think a, a link that a lot of scholars need to, to study a little bit more is, is the fact that this lost cause narrative about the Confederacy really comes about in the 1890s at the exact same time that upper class whites are needing to divide poor whites and blacks who are banding together in populism, big P populism. Yeah, that's really, and I was wondering about the populist element because as it affected um, white Southerners, I mean, certainly in my experience growing up, and I did not grow up in the South, but uh, when I became a young adult, I knew a lot of Southerners and spent some time there. And I, I, white Southerners, it seemed to me, even lower income white Southerners, by that time had a very, very strong identification with the memory of the Deep South. I mean, I remember one work friends uh, would talk about this all the time, the South's gonna rise again and all that stuff. And I finally said to him, and do what? You know, what are you saying when you say, I don't even understand, uh, what, secede again or what? And, and he actually looked at me with a very puzzled expression and said, you know, I never thought about it. And it seemed to me like that sort of mythological um, momentum or inertia where there was this sentimental, and is, I guess, a sentimental attachment to the antebellum South on the part of people who historically probably never got any benefit from it. Am I right about that, number one? And number two, if so, how do you account for it? Oh, absolutely, you're, you're right. And there are so many times throughout Southern history that white, poor whites and working class whites do really realize that their interests align with blacks and then they try to band together. But what happens each time is that it's crushed out by the, the upper classes, uh, usually through violence. We have to remember what an incredibly violent place the South was up until just very recently. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and the other thing, um, these people, these, these descendants of slaveholders are still literally the people who are in control. Their descendants are in control. Wealth never really changes hands in the South. The, the Deep South, the area that I talk about, is the poorest region in the country. It is the last in the country in education and healthcare and all of these basic standards of living. And it's not just due to the abject poverty. We, we left people right out of slavery and the fact that we did nothing for them and in fact worked against their interests in everything um, post reconstruction through all of the horrors of Jim Crow, all the economic disenfranchisement, um, racist banking practices, redlining, you know, I could go on and on. But also it's because the South's labor system, and particularly these plantation areas, was deeply exploitative, not only to blacks, but to, to poor white, working class whites as well. You so know, it's, it's a large population of poor people. Yeah. And, and, and as you put one of the quotes that, uh, I mentioned to you before we went on the air that struck me from your piece was you quote, no, with a sent, this is the sentence, non-slaveholders accused the Confederacy of raising, quote, of waging, quote, a rich man's war and a poor man's fight, meaning the poor people had to fight on behalf of the wealthy. And man, is that not a timeless quote, a quote for the ages, a quote relevant today. And I guess in closing, Carrie Lee Merritt, I would just say that in your article, you also talk a lot about 
uh, the poor whites who resisted uh, the Confederate draft by going off into the swamp that you describe and into, you know, the free state of Jones and deserters in Lank, uh, Lake and Covington County. And one of the things you also note is how important the skills and the leadership of freed slaves was to ensuring that these fugitive communities uh, of white people or were able to survive because of the leadership of freed slaves. I, I've got that right, don't I? Absolutely. Yeah, people, both freed, slave, freed slaves and the enslaved themselves, people that were still living under slavery, were absolutely essential in aiding these men, not only by teaching them ways to essentially run away and hide out from the Confederate army, from you know rubbing onions and different herbs on their feet so that the, the dogs can't track them, but also um, they, they were literally bringing them food. You know, these men are hiding out in the woods and the swamps on, on islands in the Mississippi River, and a lot of these enslaved people are literally cooking and bringing them food so that they survive. And it's, it's, so it's not just due to their families and their white wives and, and children, it's actually enslaved people that help, um, you know, create this kind of three front battleground for slaveholders. Slaveholders are, by the end of the war fighting, not only the, the Union, but the enslaved themselves who are freeing themselves and then poor whites as well. You know, it's a fascinating glimpse of a history that I think too many people, especially in the northern coastal enclaves, simplify too much. There's a richness and a dimensionality to it that uh, your piece gives us a glimpse of. So thanks for that. And again, the piece is War Happens in Dark Places 2 in Contingent Magazine. And the author and our guest is historian and writer Carrie Lee Merritt. So Carrie Lee, thanks for writing it and thanks for coming on the program. Thank you so much. It was an honor and a great conversation. Thank you. I really enjoyed it too. I hope you join us again.